and uh, Avatari Desh. We have uh, 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 Rasanath Prabhu is, is there as a leader. Uh, Siddhagaranga Prabhu and Bahuru Prabhu are there. They have just found okay. the way. Uh, Abhimida, can you highlight them along with me? Uh, along with uh, Pavanima Prabhu? Hare <coughs> Krishna. Maharaj, uh, they are the leaders from uh, uh, Avatar Age. Hare Krishna. You can introduce yourself, Prabhu, please, so that Maharaj can identify both of you. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept our humble obeisances at your lotus feet. Please accept my humble obeisances. Please to meet you. And, and, and we have uh, uh, from uh, Balram Pesh, uh, his name is Varadopal Prabhuji. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dhanavad Pranam, please accept our humble obeisances. Hare Krishna Prabhu, please accept my obeisances. Now, now I request uh, His Grace uh, Pavani Mai Prabhu, who is our uh, board member, to introduce you, Maharaj, to the audience. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Welcome you to this uh, weekly Srimad Bhagavatam class. Let us welcome His Holiness Bhakti Vigna Vinash Narasimha Swami Maharaj by chanting one time Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Hare Krishna, Hare, Hare Krishna. Krishna. I mean, we all are familiar with Maharaj's class. We have visited so many times, and everybody Just knows. What does it say? The meeting has been uh, live streamed. Good morning. Uh, okay. Yeah. Please, please go ahead, Prof. Yes, sir. Sorry, Maharaj. Okay. Maharaj, Maharaj was initiated in 1971 and uh, the very next year he got the second initiation and then in 1994 Maharaj was sannyas initiated by His Holiness Tamal Krishna Goswami Maharaj and since then Maharaj is actively preaching in all the Asian countries, most in Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, and he frequently visits Middle East also. And the very important thing about Maharaj is, uh, it is said that one who knows Maharaj, they'll know that Maharaj really talks. You know, what, what, what he talks, he does. This is the thing. And so much faith in Holy Name, and so many people, they have been inspired by Maharaj's talk. And he's actively involved in Mayapur Institute also, uh, taking a lot of courses, preaching all over, and so let us now, without any further delay, let's move on to Maharaj and hear Srimad Bhagavatam Katha from His Holiness Bhakti Vigna Vinash Narasimha Swami Maharaj. His Holiness Bhakti Vigna Vinash Narasimha Swami Maharaj ki jai. Jai. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Thank you, Prabhu. Jai. Okay. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Okay, I'm going to read Srimad Bhagavatam. I've selected a verse from the 6th canto, chapter 1, which is on the history of the life of Ajamil. This is text number 19. I'll just read the Sanskrit to you. Sikrinmana Krishna Padara Vindaya Niveshitam Tad Guna Ragi Yeriha Nate Yamam Pasha Britas Chad Tad Batan Swapne Pipasyanti Hichirna Niskrita Sakremana Krishna Padara Vindayar Naveshitam Tad Guna Ragi Yeriha Nate Yaman Pasa Britas Chatad Bhatan Swapne Pipashyanti Hichirna Niskrita Just one more time Sakremana Krishna Padara Vindayar Naveshitam 
Okay, we'll read the word meaning. Sakrit, once only. Are we having translation for this class? Not necessary? Not necessary, Maharaj. Okay, very good. Mana, the mind. Krishna Padar Aravinda Yor, unto the two lotus feet of Lord Krishna. Niveshitam, completely surrendered. Tat, of Krishna. Gunaragi, which is somewhat attached to the qualities, name, form, and paraphernalia. Yea, by whom? Iha, in this world. Na, not. Te, such persons. Yama, yamam. Yamaraj, the superintendent of death. Pasha Brita, those who carry ropes to catch sinful persons. Cha and Tat, his. Batam, order carriers. Swapne Api, even in dreams. Pashyanti, see, he indeed. Chirna Niskrita, who have performed the right type of atonement. Translation. Although not having fully realized Krishna, persons who have even once surrendered completely unto his lotus feet and who have become attracted to his name, form, qualities and pastimes are completely freed of all sinful reactions, for they have thus accepted the true method of atonement. Even in dreams, such surrendered souls do not see Yamaraj or his order carriers who are equipped with ropes to bind the sinful. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, 1866, Sarva dharmam paragyashnam amikam sharanam braja aham tvam sarva pape bhyo moksha yishyani masuja. Abandon all varieties of religion and just surrender unto me. I shall deliver you from all sinful reaction. Do not fear. The same principle is described here. Sakrinmana krishna padara vindayo. If by studying Bhagavad Gita, one decides to surrender to Krishna, he is immediately freed from all sinful reactions. It is also significant that Sukadeva Goswami, having several times repeated the words Vasudeva Parayana and Narayana Parayana, finally says Krishna Padara Vindoyoy. Thus he indicates that Krishna is the origin of both Narayan and Vasudev. Even though Narayan and Vasudev are not different from Krishna, simply by surrendering to Krishna, one fully surrenders to all his expansions, such as Narayan, Vasudeva and Govinda. As Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita 7.7, Mataparataram Nanyat, there is no truth superior to me. There are many names and forms of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but Krishna is the Supreme Form. Krishna stu Bhagavan Swayam. Therefore, Krishna recommends to neophyte devotees that one should surrender unto him only. Mummy come. Because neophyte devotees cannot understand what the forms of Narayan, Vasudeva and Govinda are, Krishna directly says, Mamikam. Herein, this is also supported by the word Krishna Pararavinda Yoy. Narayana does not speak personally, but Krishna or Vasudev does, as in Bhagavad Gita, for example. Therefore, to follow the direction of Bhagavad Gita, means to surrender unto Krishna. And to surrender in this way is the highest perfection of bhakti yoga. 
Pariksit Maharaj had inquired from Sukadeva Goswami how one can be saved from falling into the various conditions of hellish life. In this verse, Sukadev Goswami answers that a soul who is surrendered to Krishna certainly cannot go to Narak, hellish existence. To say nothing of going there, even in his dreams, he does not see Yamaraj or his order carriers who are able to take one there. In other words, if one wants to save himself from falling into Narak, hellish life, he should fully surrender to Krishna. The word Sakrit is significant because it indicates that if one sincerely surrenders to Krishna once, he is saved, even if by chance he falls down by committing sinful activities. Therefore, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita 9.30, even if one commits the most abominable actions, if he is engaged in devotional service, he is considered saintly because he is properly situated. If one never for a moment forgets Krishna, he is safe even if by chance he falls down by committing sinful acts. In the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, the Lord also says, Niha bikrama na shosti pratyavayo na vidyate svalpam apiyasya dharmasya trayate mahato bayat. In this endeavor, there is no loss or diminution and a little advancement on this path can protect one from the most dangerous type of fear. Elsewhere in the Gita, the Lord says, Nahi kauyena krit kaschid durgatam tatagachati. One who performs auspicious activities is never overcome by evil. The highest kauyana or auspicious activity is to surrender to Krishna. That is the only path by which to save oneself from falling down into hellish life. Srila Prabodhananda Saraswati has confirmed this as follows. Kaivam narakatayate tridashur padasha pushpayate durdantendriya kala sarpapata proktata damstrayate vishvam purva sukayate Vidi Mahendri Ascha Kitiryate Yatkarunya Kataksha Vaikvavatam Tam Goram Evastuma. The sinful actions of one who is surrendered unto Krishna are compared to a snake with its poison fangs removed. Proktata Dumstrayate. Such a snake is no longer to be feared. Of course, one should not commit sinful activities on the strength of having surrendered to Krishna. However, even if one has surrendered to Krishna and happens to do something sinful because of his former habit, such sinful actions no longer have a destructive effect. Therefore, one should adhere to the lotus feet of Krishna very tightly and serve him under the direction of the spiritual master. Thus, in all conditions, one will become akutobhaya, free from fear. Oma jnana timarandasya jnananjana shalakaya chaksurun militanyena tasmai shri gurave namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvisesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vanchakaupa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha 
Patitanam Pavane Bio Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasari Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So in the Srimad Bhagavatam we see how in the fourth canto or first of all third canto Sukadeva Goswami is describing the creation and he's describing the primary phase of creation then in the fourth canto he goes into the secondary phase of creation meaning creation of Brahma and then the fifth canto we heard about the planetary systems and then at the end of the fifth canto chapter 26 Sukadeva Goswami described about different kinds of hell where people go so when Maharaj Parikshit was hearing about all the different kinds of hell which are there, he became very concerned because he's a devotee and he doesn't like to hear about people suffering. So when he heard about all the different hells and how much people are going through there in these hellish conditions, he thought how could they be delivered? And that was the beginning of the sixth canto. The, Maharaj Parikshit was asking Sukadeva Goswami that what do we need to do to get saved from these sinful reactions? Well, first of all, we have to understand the cause of sin. There are three causes to sin. The sinful activities, of course, are the cause of sin. Sinful desires result in our sin are the sinful desires there lead us to perform sinful activities and sinful desires come from ignorance so it's ignorance which is the root of all sin so we have these three factors which are all connected to each other which are the cause of sinful life ignorance sinful desires and then sinful activities and this three things lead to the distress, the, the suffering which the living entities go through and the reason and, and ends up with them being put into hell. So Sukadeva so Goswami was replying to Maharaj Pariksha's question and as, an, as a teacher he wanted to test the alertness of his student. So Sukadeva Goswami first of all spoke about the process of prayaschit or atonement that by undergoing some type of pious activities we can counteract the sinful activities this is what atonement is all about in terms for a material for materialistic people for karmis they will do sinful activities and then they will want to counteract them by doing pious activities. We see people come to holy places like Mayapur and they will come and bathe in the Ganga and they will give some charity to the deities also. But it, it's not that they're finished with their sinful activities. They often come and perform these kind of pious activities to counteract some of their past sins so that they can go on with their sinful life. Maharaj Parikshit, when he heard Sukadeva Goswami present the process of atonement, he was not taken in, he was not, he didn't accept it. And he blankly told Sukadeva Goswami that that is not going to stop People. That's not going to save people from going to hell because you cannot stop one material activity, one fruitive activity by another fruitive activity. That's what the process of atonement is about. 
you do some sin, something sinful, it's a fruit of activity for your own enjoyment, and you try to counteract it by doing some atonement, by doing some pious activity, like giving some charity or chanting some mantras, performing some kind of vow, these kind of things. So we will think we can counteract our sinful activity by doing some pious activity. So Maharaj Parikshit understood that the problem here is that while you may counteract the sinful activity, you're going to go on and commit more sinful activities. So the desire for sin is not taken away. While you may be able to counteract the sinful activities themselves, the desire for sin is still there in the heart. Therefore, Maharaj Parikshit told Sukadev Goswami that this process of atonement is simply like the bathing of an elephant. The elephant will take a bath and immediately after coming out of the water and having a nice bath and getting clean, he will want to throw dirt over his body or even roll in the dirt. The elephants, they have that habit. And materialistic people are like that. They perform sinful activities, they want to counteract them by some pious activity, and they will go on performing more sinful activities. The desire for sinful activities is still in the heart. It hasn't been removed. Therefore, Maharaj Pariksit requested Sukadeva Goswami, there must be something better than the process of atonement. And Sukadeva Goswami then suggested the process of cultivating knowledge, the path of Jnana Kanda. Having rejected the path of karma or karmakanda, Sukadeva Goswami then presented the path of jnana kanda. That if people will cultivate speculative knowledge, for example, by studying scriptures and hearing scriptures like the Dharma Shastras, Dharma Shastras include such books as the Manu Samhita. So if people will hear the Jnana Shastras, they cultivate some knowledge, they understand what is the proper mood, what should be done, what should not be done. But still, the problem with cultivating knowledge is that, well, one problem is that there's a tendency towards impersonalism. There's a tendency to be drawn into the oneness thinking ultimately everything is one and the goal is to merge. And the other problem is that the material desires can still grow up. The, the, material, the desire for sinful activities has still not been removed. Although the reactions to the sins has been countered by cultivating knowledge, but there is still the chance that the desire for sinful activities will again arise in the heart. The example is given that just like in a forest, sometimes there will be a fire and all the creepers and bushes are all burned down. But then after some time there will be a heavy rainstorm and then the trees and creepers and things which were burned down will begin to grow again. Because while the, whatever was above the surface of the ground was burned, the roots are still in the ground. And the, when the, the roots gradually get nourishment in the form of rain, they begin to grow again. So in the same way, the desire for sinful activity again comes in the heart, even though one has cultivated knowledge. Therefore, Sukadeva Goswami himself, without waiting to hear from Maharaj Parikshit, Sukadeva Goswami went on to describe that the ultimate atonement is the process of devotional service. The process of devotional service 
is likened to the, the rising of the sun in the early morning. Desires for sinful activities are compared to the fog. Sometimes we often see in the winter time here in Mayapur, there's a fog which comes off the Ganges in the early morning. But as soon as the rays of the sun, as soon as the first rays of the sun appear, then immediately the fog is dispelled and it never returns. In the same way, where there is devotional service, even the trace of devotional service, the first signs of devotional service, the effect of that devotion is it will counteract all the tendency towards sinful life and even the desire for sin will be removed from the heart. And only bhakti yoga can do this. This is the supreme potency of Lord Sri Krishna, that he can remove the desire for sin from the heart. However, we want to understand the purpose of devotional service is not simply to counteract our sinful life. If we, are sim if we are thinking of bhakti yoga as simply the means of counteracting our sinful life, that is material, that is not actually spiritual. It is not proper to take advantage of Bhakti Devi by performing devotional service. We are, appro we are approaching Bhakti Devi. So it is not proper for us to utilize her to destroy our sinful activities. Rather, the purpose of Bhakti Yoga is for us to awaken our pure Krishna consciousness and to develop our love for the Supreme Lord. It's important for us to understand the actual goal of devotional service. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself used to say, Prem Punarto Mahan, that the goal of life is to develop love of God. Our goal is to develop attraction for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Svanyastitasya Dharmasya uh, Duties executed by all men are only so much useless labor if they don't provoke attraction for the message of the Personality of Godhead. Right? Shrama Evahi Kevalam just simply useless labor. If we are simply getting rid of our sins, we want to get the real goal of bhakti yoga, to develop Krishna consciousness. Therefore, in this section of Srimad Bhagavatam, Sukadeva Goswami also, just a few verses earlier, he described the process of practicing bhakti yoga. And he mentions about the importance of serving the lotus feet of a Vaishnava. In other words, we have to accept a spiritual teacher and we should associate with him and serve him. That is the sure way for us to develop our Krishna consciousness. When we can get the association of the great souls, the Mahatmas, then we learn from them how to be constantly absorbed in Krishna's service. Mahatmas are described in the Bhagavad Gita, Mahatmanas tumamparta daivim prakritim ashrita vajantyananyam manaso gyadva bhutadim avyayam and satatam kirtayantomam yatantas chajadavrita namashyantas chamam bhaktya nitya yukta apashate. These Mahatmas are under the protection of my divine energy. 
They're fully engaged in my devotional service, always chanting my glories, endeavouring with determination. These great souls perpet perpetually worship me with devotion. So, if we get the opportunity to associate with and serve the devotee like that, then this is the best training for our Krishna consciousness, that we will learn how to absorb ourselves in thinking of Krishna. Just as it's mentioned in this verse which we read today, Krishna Pararabinda Yoy, right? Engage the mind in thinking of the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. So our Krishna conscious process is very practical and very methodical also. We just simply have to follow the system. We go through the different stages of devotion. We come in contact with the devotees and we develop some faith. We learn how to engage ourselves in different devotional activities. We are connected to a spiritual master and we get initiation. And then we work on purifying our heart and getting rid of the material desires from the heart, getting free of our attachments and becoming steady in Krishna consciousness, coming to that stage of nishta, where we're very steady every day, we just regularly, without fail, we will chant, we will hear, we will worship the Lord. And then we go on, we come to ruchi, we're getting taste, we're feeling so much bliss, even though the elements of Krishna consciousness may be lacking, but still we feel so much taste, so much pleasure in it. Then we become detached from all material circumstances and we go on to develop devotional service in ecstasy, bhava, and then prema bhakti, love of God. So these are the different stages of Krishna consciousness which we want. We want to come through these stages and come up to the higher level of Krishna consciousness to experience the real pleasure of devotional service. This Krishna conscious process is described here and it's mentioned akutobhaya, devotee is free from fear. Now in the other processes Sukadeva Goswami had made it clear the, the superiority of bhakti over the jnana kanda and the karma kanda. And it's seen in the fact that the devotee is fearless. The devotee is without fear because Lord Krishna is there for the shelter of the devotee. As we quoted the verse from the 18th chapter 66, Krishna says, surrender to me, I will free you from all sinful reactions, do not fear. So we don't have to be afraid of anything, because Lord Krishna has promised he's going to protect his devotee. But if you're doing the Karmakanda path, you have to be worried, because there will be so many people envious of you. You're enjoying the material world, you're getting the fruit and you're enjoying material results that makes people envy you. And when you have people envy you, it means they become like your enemy. They're not so friendly with you anymore. There's no loving friendship. This is a problem with karma kanda, that you simply make enemies. You don't get friends. People envy you. They want to they don't like you, they, they want to cheat you sometimes and they want to take advantage of you or even steal from you. Because you're on the path of karma, you're enjoying karma. So it's a very insecure path. And if, uh, if you're on the path of jnana, cultivating knowledge, then the problem is loneliness because we're thinking ultimately everything is one and we're thinking there's no variety and if there's no variety 
then there's no mercy and there is no care. You're simply alone. There's nobody to give you mercy. There's nobody who's going to care for you. This is the jnana path, the jnana khanda, the cultivating knowledge, impersonal knowledge, impersonalistic knowledge, mental speculation will put one into that situation. Not very pleasant. But in the path of devotion, the devotee is very secure. He has the shelter of Lord Krishna and Lord Krishna's devotees. And Lord Krishna has promised his devotees how he will take care of them. We know from ninth chapter Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, uh, Yoga Kshima Vahamiyaham. You like something, I will carry it. What you have something, I will preserve it for you. Lord Krishna promises to take care of his devotees. Just a little endeavor on our path can give us that perfection. Sukadeva Goswami mentions here, anyone who surrenders even one time, then they never have to worry about seeing hell. They're not very strong in philosophy, they're not very renounced. They may never have practiced karmakanda or jnanakanda. They have no knowledge of these things. They don't know anything. They're not great scholars. They're not great renunciates. But they have that devotion. They have faith in the Supreme Lord. And they chant the name of the Lord. So simply by that act of devotion, they attract the mercy of the Lord. And Krishna takes care of the devotee and carries them to the other side of the material existence. So devotees are simply surrendering to Krishna, right? Our Krishna consciousness movement is all about surrender. Bhagavad Gita, of course, the message of the Bhagavad Gita is surrender. But that surrender itself is such a, a pleasant experience. We're, some people think that, oh, if we have to surrender, you know, like in wartime, two sides are fighting, then one side may surrender. They become the prisoners of the other side. And they become captured and defeated. So in the same way, we think that if I surrender to Krishna, I will be... I'm not going to benefit, it will be harmful for me, I'll be his prisoner. But we should understand that surrendering to Krishna means taking shelter of Krishna. When we come to Krishna and surrender ourselves to him, Krishna is very pleased to give us shelter and to take care of us and to protect us. Surrendering is not depriving us of anything. Rather, it's giving us the greatest opportunity to cultivate our full spiritual consciousness. We're all spiritual beings and we have an eternal relationship with Krishna. But we've fallen into this material world and we've become absorbed and the path of sense gratification, trying to enjoy the material world. In that mood, we try to compete with Krishna. We're thinking, I am the enjoyer. We're thinking, I will be the controller. And sometimes impersonalists, they will even train their, their disciples to, to think like that. Prabhupada was in New York in the 1960s and there was a, a yoga school near to Prabhupada's 26th Second Avenue where Prabhupada had established the first Krishna Conscious Center. So nearby there was some, in, some yogi teaching Hatha Yoga and the, the yogi was a Mayavadi and he would have his students come and sit and then he would tell them to meditate 
and he would say to them, meditate, now you are controlling the sun. And they would all repeat after him, now I am controlling the sun. And then he would say to them, now you are controlling the moon. And they would all say, now I am controlling the moon. It's so nonsense, so ridiculous. What control do they have? They cannot even control their bowels. And then after the yoga course, after the yoga class was over in the evening, they would all go outside and they would buy beer and smoke cigarettes and do all nonsense activities. So they were thinking they were controlling the sun and the moon. They cannot even control their tongue. So Krishna consciousness is realistic. We understand what is the challenge. We have to control the mind and senses. There has to be some regulation for these activities. We want to take up devotional service. What is required? What is required is actually that we follow the four regulative principles. Recently, one of our senior devotees was describing how he had a talk with Srila Prabhupada and he was questioning Prabhupada. He said, Prabhupada, do you imagine that in the future it may happen that some of our devotees may become uh, prominent in society and they may even become even like political figures and like that? And Prabhupada said, yes, possible. And so then the devotee asked, he said, he said, will it be possible to keep our Krishna consciousness if one takes on such a position with such responsibilities? And Prabhupada said, yes, definitely, why not? So the devotee said, what, what will be required? And Srila Prabhupada said, simply you have to maintain four regulative principles and the daily chanting of 16 rounds. If you keep the standard of the four regulative principles and chanting daily at least 16 rounds, then you won't be troubled by the material energy. You will remain Krishna conscious. Even though you may be engaged in so many material, worldly activities. So we should understand these four principles which are mentioned. These are not just simply principles of morality. Sometimes we think, oh, it's, it's just, these are just moral principles. I should be a vegetarian. I shouldn't take intoxication, I shouldn't gamble or illicit connection with the opposite sex, I should be moral. But we should understand, when we talk about the four regulative principles, it is not just a question of morality, but it's a question of actual knowledge. These are four principles of knowledge. People who have proper understanding will know that these four principles are based on sound knowledge. First of all, they are mentioned in the scriptures. Within the scriptures there are mentions of these different activities. Sometimes people challenge us that where in the scriptures does it say we shouldn't do these things? Well, you just have to read the scriptures and it's very clearly presented there within the scriptures. There are principles by which we are supposed to live and act. And these principles are meant for all civilized people. And if we strictly follow these four principles and daily chant 16 rounds, then this will keep us in the process of devotional service. Devotional service is based on nine angas. The nine angas, right? Shravanam, Kirtan, Vishnu, Smaranam, Parasevanam, 
Archanam Vandam Dashyam Sakyam Atmani Vedanam. So these are the nine Angas, and Rupa Goswami, of course, he has emphasized from these nine, he has given great importance on five principles. And he said that even a little attraction for any one of these five things can give one perfection. And these five activities are hearing the scriptures like Srimad Bhagavatam, engaging in Sankirtan, the chanting of the holy names of the Lord, worshipping the deity, associating with devotees, and residing in a holy place. So these are five activities which are very powerful and any one of them can give us perfection. Particularly, we, we want to understand how Srila Prabhupada incorporated these things into our ISKCON centers. And by doing so, he made each of our ISKCON centers into a holy place. Because within each of our ISKCON centers, there will be all of these activities. There will be association with devotees, there will be discussion of the Shastra, there will be chanting of the holy name and worship of the deity. And by these activities, that place becomes a holy place itself. Our temples are not ordinary places, they're not just any ordinary place in the material world. Our centers of Krishna consciousness are actually embassies of the spiritual world. Just like when we walk into the center, the Krishna conscious center, we can immediately experience the atmosphere, how it's surcharged with spiritual energy. And that spiritual energy comes about by the devotional activities which are being performed regularly there. I remember myself when I first went to our temple in London in 1971, I walked off the, out of off the streets of London into the temple, I was over, overwhelmed. I was just amazed. The spiritual energy was so powerful. So this is Krishna consciousness. We want to encourage people in these activities. The morning program in our Krishna conscious centers is based on these four activities, or five activities because it's being performed in the temple, so it's also a holy place. But the morning program is full with hearing and chanting, worshipping the deity and associating with devotees. Very, very powerful. So even during this particular time in the world, where because of pandemic, we're not so free to go to temples and to associate, but within our own home we can take part in these activities. We have the opportunity with the help of technology to view the deities being worshipped. We can see the different temples around the world and we can have a darshan of their deities. And we can hear the Bhagavad classes being spoken by the different temples in the different temples, the different devotees. We can see the kirtan and hear the kirtans they're performing and we see also the devotees participating in these activities. In this way we have the opportunity, all of us, to participate in the activities of bhakti, panch anga bhakti, right? The five angas of devotional service, which Rupa Goswami emphasized because he knows that just a little taste for any one of these things will help us to easily come to the perfectional stage. So in the verse we've been reading today, Sukadeva Goswami has mentioned that if anyone surrenders even once to the Lord, he never has to fear going to Yamaraj or being taken by the Yamaduts. And 
of in that in this sixth canto of the first chapter they're going to tell the the story about ajamila and the power of the holy name that you chant the holy name and because, although ajamila was a sinful person but because he was calling the name of his son which happened to be narayan all of his sins had been destroyed this is a very important point about the Krishna conscious philosophy. The verse to support this comes in the third canto spoken by Devahuti to Lord Kapila, her son. Lord Kapila had been instructing his mother about the philosophy of Sankhya Yoga and after hearing everything then Devahuti was very convinced and then she replied to her son Lord Kapila she, Yannama deha shravanadu kirtanad yat pranavad yat smaranad api kachat svadyopi sadhya shravanaya kaupate kutaspanastam bhagavanna darshanat. Devahuti is saying that what to speak of someone who is so fortunate to see the Lord face to face because Mother Devahuti understood her good fortune, that her son was actually the Lord himself. So she said, what to speak of one who is fortunate enough to see the Lord face to face, but even if one is born in a family of dog eaters. Now, to be born in a family of dog eaters is a low birth. That is an example of someone suffering from uh, sinful reaction. Eh? Pramida, the, the pra, pramida, pramida, yeah, the sinful reaction. There are sinful reactions which are manifest when the sinful reactions are manifest. So, to be born in a low family, like I myself, I'm also born in a low family. I'm born outside the Vedic culture in the malicious society, the Western civilization. So I'm also an example like that. I also have that uh, parabdha karma that I'm born in the malicha or yavana society. So Devahuti said, even though you are born in the family of dog eaters, but anybody who even once chants your holy name or remembers you, or hears your glories, or offers obeisances to you, they become immediately qualified to perform the Vedic sacrifice. Now we know that traditionally to perform a Vedic sacrifice you should be a Brahmana. But Mother Devahuti is saying, even you're born in a family of dog eaters, but you just one time chant the holy name, or you remember the Lord, or you offer obeisance, then you become qualified. Of course, there's quality in chanting the holy name. There's quality in performing devotional service. But the point is there, that anybody who does these things properly, then all of their parabdha karma is all destroyed. Even though they're born in a low birth, they can become qualified to perform the Vedic sacrifice. This is the power of Bhakti Yoga. This is the power of the holy name of the Lord. So this Srimad Bhagavatam again and again is reminding us about the significance of the chanting of the holy name and how we have to take advantage of the holy name. We have to take advantage of all the different angas of devotion that the goal of life, we will never get it from karma kanda or jnana kanda or any of the other processes, mystic yoga or whatever. But the actual real ultimate benefit and freedom, relief from all sinful reactions will, can, can only come through the practice of bhakti yoga. Sukadeva Goswami is showing the supremacy of the path of bhakti over all the other paths. And we see this also in Bhagavad Gita, of course. Lord Krishna has also said at the end of the sixth chapter, Yogi nam apisarvesham madgatenan taratmanam. Of all yogis, the highest yogi 
as the one who is always absorbed in me, who thinks of me within himself and is engaged in my transcendental loving service. The conclusion is there. Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, every, he's telling the superiority of bhakti, the supremacy of bhakti. We are so fortunate. Somehow we be we are just so fortunate, at least I consider myself to be the most fortunate because coming from a low background, coming from a degraded culture, somehow I have had the opportunity to come into the path of Krishna consciousness. And I'm asking all of you souls who are born in this Vedic culture to take advantage of this culture and to perfect your life through the practice of Bhakti Yoga. All right, so we will stop here and we will ask if there's some questions. Thank you, Maharaj. Now I request Balwan to move in. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Pramaj. So Maharaj, I will be coordinating the question answer session. Yes. Uh, yeah, Maharaj. So thank you Maharaj for the wonderful class. Uh, Maharaj, <coughs> there's a question from a devotee. He's asking that it is said for Grahastha, in practice of devotion, balancing between material life and spiritual life is not possible. One has to leave all material desires to achieve perfection. Is this true? First of all, there are many of the, if we consider the Mahajans, the Mahajans are our authorities on the path of devotional service. Now, just look how many of the Mahajans are in householder life. Let's go through the 12 names of the Mahajans. Swayambhu Brahma. Swayambhu Brahma, he's a Grihastha. Swayambhu Narada Shambhu, Lord Shiva, he's a Grihastha. Pralado Janako Bhishmo, Pralad Maharaj is a Grihastha. Janak Maharaj is a Grihastha. Swayambhu Narada Shambhu, Komar, Komar Kapilo Manu, Komar. Four Kumars, Kapila and Manu, Manu is a Grihastha. Pralado Janako Bhishmo Balir Bayasaki Vayam. Bali. Bali is Bali Maharaj, is a Grihasta. And then Vayam, Yamaraj. Yamaraj also Grihasta. So there's so many great souls who are Grihastas. Why do you think you can become perfect as a Grihasta? There's so many examples in our Srimad Bhagavatam of Grihastas. Lord Krishna himself has so many wives. Why do you think? You cannot become perfect as a Grihastha. Ramananda Rai was a Grihastha. The qualification is to know the science of Krishna. It does not matter whether you're a Grihastha or a sannyasi. That's not important. What is important is that you know the science of Krishna. Then you can even become a spiritual teacher. So yes, you have to balance the material and the spiritual. You have some responsibilities as a grihasta. A devotee is not neglectful. But you shouldn't neglect your spiritual duties either. You have material duties, you have also spiritual duties. You have to take care of both. If you simply cultivate your material life, what do you profit at the end? There's no gain. So you have to have a balance, material and spiritual life. Prabhupada gave example, train runs on two tracks. Two tracks should be level. If your tracks are not level, the train will turn over. And so if you try to go too much on the material, it's not good. And you don't want to go too quickly onto the spiritual. As a Grihasta, you have to take care of your family. And you have, probably have a job. But Grihastas, they also move on. That we say after the age of 50 or later, you should detach and you should become Vanaprastha and take up more full time spiritual duties. So Grihastha life is for spending with the family. But then there's retired life. 
where you can put more emphasis into your spiritual practice. So, not necessarily that you have to leave home, you can stay with your home, stay in your home, you can stay with your family, or you can also bring your wife with you and come and visit holy places. You don't have to separate from your wife, you can stay with her. But you have to emphasize the spiritual practice. After the age of 50, we have to understand death warning is there. Any time we may have to leave the body. So you have to take you have to take care and take precaution, and get ready to leave the body. We have to practice, that's what increase our spiritual practice. That is the the point of spiritual life. There's a specific program there, you see? So, as we get older, you have to emphasize more the spiritual practice. In family life, you have a balance, but later on you have retired life and you put more emphasis onto your spiritual practice. Is it clear? Thank you, Maharaj. Whereas the next question is, uh, how do we differentiate between prescribed duties and karma kanda? Prescribed duties are necessary. Without material desires, how can one perform prescribed duties? Especially for devotees in the present age of Kali Yuga, when renunciation is not only difficult but also impractical. Sometimes we see devotees want to prematurely give up their responsibilities of prescribed duties in the name of bhakti. Dear bhakti, uh, and then, uh, so, Maharaj, that's a question. Uh-huh. There are a number of questions there, I think. Yeah, multiple <laughs> questions. Quite a few. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so, uh, prescribed duties. And, uh, well, maybe... Prescribed duty and karma kanda. So, prescribed duties would means, for example, brahmachari. Brahmachari has prescribed duty. Brahmachari's duty is to study scriptures and the Brahmachari also will go out and beg on behalf of the spiritual master and whatever he collects he should give to the spiritual teacher. And so there are different duties according to our varna and ashram. That is prescribed duty. Grihastas duty. Grihastas they have their duty. For example, they have to give charity. That's a duty for the grihastas, they give charity. They don't have any, any wealth, then they can give the holy name. And Prabhupada explained to people when they were householders, he said, you should invite people to your home to take food. And when food is ready, you even call out, food is ready in our home, anybody hungry, you can come and eat. So that is the duty of grihastha life, sharing, not being private, but sharing whatever you have with others. And according to your varna, prescribed duties will be there. Brahman, Brahman's prescribed duty, worships a deity, teaches others to worship the deity, study the scriptures, teaches others the scriptures and he accepts charity and he can also give charity. So that's a brahmana supposed to do that. Whatever he knows, brahmana is supposed to teach. And then for the kshatriya, then their duty, they're, they're supposed to manage and take care and protect people. The kshatriyas are like the, the, the great kings and the rulers. And they will tr protect the innocent people, protect their citizens from the infidels and from the dacoits. And the Vaishya, his duty is to do farming and trading and protecting cows. And the Sudra duty is to serve. He's the servant of others. Whatever he's told to do, he should do. So this is prescribed duties. Now, on the material platform, we have these prescribed duties. On the spiritual platform, there's also prescribed duties. Now you see, sometimes people may give up their prescribed duties to take up spiritual duties. Well, you have to consider the situation. 
if they're actually qualified, if they're actually eligible to give up their prescribed duties, then it's all right. If they're actually able to transcend the material nature, then it's not wrong to come to the spiritual platform. However, they should remain on the spiritual platform. And they shouldn't regret, right? They shouldn't be hankering. They shouldn't have a lot of material desires. If they're going to come to the transcendental platform and engage in devotional service, giving up their prescribed duties, they have to give up their material desires. They have to put aside all material desires. They can be anxious for material gains. That's important. So one has to be qualified, one has to be ready for that. There has to be, in other words, a purification of the heart. One has to purify himself. And the, the purification process comes about, you pr do your prescribed duty and at the same time cultivate Krishna consciousness, side by side then gradually one will develop maybe a greater attraction towards the spiritual activities. And if it's, if it's appropriate, if the family are supportive, then the family may encourage the person. Look, go ahead. Children are grown up. You don't have family responsibilities much. Children are already grown up and married. And savings is there, house is there, so you can put aside your material duties and you can concentrate fully on the spiritual activities. So we have to understand what is the situation of each and every one, how much material responsibilities they have, and are they ready? If it's premature, then they'll get problems. If they have not purified the heart, if the material desires are still there in the heart, then they may renounce and then after some time then they come back. But then that's not, not very good. That they give up the world, they tried for some time, but they couldn't, then they come back again. Okay. So the point is, you have to purify the heart. You have to... It, it, you have to, one has to make oneself ready for that kind of renunciation, to give up prescribed duties. We have to work, everyone has to work. It's not that we give up prescribed duties to be idle. It has to be, one, it has to be very clear what is the person going to do. If he's going to give up his prescribed material duties, what is he going to do? What is his engagement going to be? It has to be very clear. You don't do these things abruptly, and we don't do them without consultation with the senior Vaishnavas. That's important. We should not act independently, and we should not act impulsively. It should be very carefully planned. Okay? Thank you, Maharaj, for the wonderful answer. Whereas the next question is, uh, it's, it's, sometimes it is difficult to understand the example of Ajami, as he was sinful throughout his life, but uttered the word Narayana just once, that too unknowingly, still Lord protected him. Um, but we heard that, you know, we have to practice taking Lord's name constantly. Still we are able, not able to remember, you know, during difficult times. So will we remember Lord at the time of death? Well, we have to understand that Ajamil did not chant the name of Narayan just simply once. He chanted it many, many times because it was the name of his child. He'd given, and this young child was very dear to him. It was his youngest son and it was very dear to him. So he was always calling the name of his son. Regular, constantly he's calling, Narayan, where are you? Narayan, come, Narayan, come, take your food. Narayan, wake up. Narayan, go to sleep. Narayan, come with me. Always, constantly he was call, calling the name of the Lord, Narayan. But it was only at the time of death that when the Yamadudas came, 
and he chanted for, he called for his son, and then at that time, then he remembered how as a young man, he had been a brahmana and he had worshipped the Lord. So we have to understand that the chanting of Ajamilas was at the intermediate stage. It was at the level of Namabhas, because when he was calling the holy name of the Lord, he was, it was not done with the intention that he will destroy his sinful activities. It was not done with the intention that, that he was even aware that he was calling the name of the Lord. It, it just simply happened that he was calling his son. So there was no false intention there. It wasn't like, you know, the offense in chanting the holy name to commit sinful activities on the strength of chanting. So that is serious. If, you, if we think that I will chant the holy name and then I will counteract my sins by chanting the holy name, that's not good. We don't just chant like that to counteract our sins. So Ajamila, he, he wasn't even thinking about anything like that. He was just calling his son. So because he did call the name of his son, it did destroy all of his sinful reactions. He got the benefit of... The, the effect of chanting at the level of Namabhas is it destroys sins. That's not enough to go back to Godhead. After the Yamaduras came, then Ajamil understood that he, he, was, he, he was fortunate, he had a second chance. Then he went to Hardwar and he stayed in a Vishnu temple and there he perfected himself in the Vishnu temple. He left the prostitute he, who he was living with. He left the family. He just went away because he was an old man. He knew he didn't have long left to live. He went to Hardwar, he stayed in a temple there, and he gave up his body on the bank of the Ganga and went back to Godhead. So he, he took advantage to fully purify himself. But the chanting of the holy name at the level of Namabhas destroys sinful reactions. And because it was it, Ajamil did that, he was chanting at Namabhas, so that's how he was able, you see, he, and remember also he was born in the Brahmana family, in his childhood he'd had a very good pious birth, he'd been a good Brahman, he'd worshipped Shaligram, Shila, he'd done a lot of things, he was, you know, actually, some, but somehow he just had become degraded. And he'd lost everything. But you see, whatever bhakti he had before, it's never lost. It's the nature of bhakti is that you, you don't lose it. It may be delayed, but it's always there. You're not going to lose it. So bhakti, the bhakti of Ajamila was suspended from his, from his youth. When he was a young man, a young brahmana, his bhakti was suspended. And then he got involved with the prostitute and he forgot everything and he was very sinful. But somehow he was still chanting Narayan, Narayan. And then the Yamaduras came. He chanted also for his son. And the Vishnuduras came and saved him. So it was a very special situation. Thank you, Maharaj, for that. Uh, next question is, at what stage of bhakti karmani, uh, karmani nirdahati happens? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Uh, Charu, Madha, uh, Charu Madha Prabhu, you want to uh, explain further on this? Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. In Brahma Samhita, we read that uh, uh, karmani nirdahati kintu cha bhakti bhajam. So that uh, all the uh, results of our activities are eliminated when we take up the process of bhakti. Okay. At what stage does this happen? What? At what stage does this happen? Yeah. Uh,
Well, just like at what stage do we get relief from distress? And the, the beginning of auspiciousness in bhakti. You know, we learn devotional service has three levels sadhana bhakti, bhava bhakti, prema bhakti. And with sadhana bhakti, we get relief from distress and the beginning of auspiciousness. At what stage does that happen? That happens at the stage of nishta. We have to be at the stage of nishta, we have to be steady. In other words, we've gone through an artha nivritti. And so similarly, Lord Brahma is saying, Yas vendra gopam atta vendra maho svakarma bandhan rupa palabhajana mapnoti karmani nirdhati kintu chabakti bhajam govindam adipursham tamaham bhajami. I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, who burns up to the roots all fruitive activities of those who are imbued with devotion. So those who are Im imbued with devotion. We have to understand that this has to be a high level of devotion. It cannot be mixed devotion. That is the point. Mixed devotion is not going to qualify us for this kind of benefit. It has to be pure unalloyed devotion. The mixed devotion, we have our own material desires, right? Rupa Goswami said, Anyabilasita sunyam jnana katma janavritam Ano koyena krishna no shilanam bhaktir uttamam. This is pure devotion. Pure devotion means uh, uh, without desires for fruitive activities or philosophical speculation. That's the tatasta lakshana. And the swarupa lakshana is that we are going to perform uh, anyabilasita sunyam. Anu kuyena. Anu kuyena means it has to be favorable. Our devotional service has to be favorable to Krishna. And for Krishna and everything in relation to Krishna. And then anushilanam. Anushilanam means activities, constant activities. So devotional service like that is understood from Rupa Goswami's definition that there's constant engagement. One is favor favorably engaged and constantly engaged in the service of Lord Krishna. Similarly, in Srimad Bhagavatam, devotional service is described, Savaipum sam paro dharmo yato bhaktirat hoksaji ahaitaki apratiyata yadatma. So, ahaitaki and apratiyata, the unmotivated and uninterrupted to completely satisfy the self. So I would understand it like this, that you want to get to burn up the roots. As we're talking about pulling out the root, you have to be, cons you have to be engaged in the proper manner. Of course, here in Srimad Bhagavatam, they're explaining in this section that even a little glimmer of bhakti is going to take away all the desire, all the, all the uh, thoughts. It's removing the roots, right? We have to pull out the roots. But just recently I was teaching nectar of devotion to some devotees and I, I, we stress that sadhana bhakti, to get the benefit of sadhana bhakti, you have to come to that level of nishta. It has to be fixed. You have to be really steady there in your devotional service. Otherwise, your devotional service is mixed. It's not pure. Like that. Okay? Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Maharaj, how is the time like? Because I have here three more questions. Can we take? Yeah, please. Yeah, okay. The next question is, in the, um, Maharaj, in the purport, Srila Prabhupada is quoting, 
even if one commits the most abominable actions, if he is engaged in devotional service, he is to be considered saintly because he is properly situated. So accident does happen to devotees also. An accident is not intentional. So in that case, how the devotee should take up the accidents and how the society should support that devotee in this regard? Yes. Srila Prabhupada elaborates on that in the purport and he explains that accidents can happen but they don't happen all the time. Once or twice accident may happen. But if an accident is happening every week, it's not accident anymore. We don't take, we cannot take that devotee as being of a very high level devotee. If every other week there's an accident, then we cannot give proper regard for that person's devotional service. So, devotee may have some fall down, some difficulties. How do we deal with it? We, on the basis of this verse, we understand, yes, the material energy is very powerful. There has to be some considerations. And the, the leaders who are governing the society, they have to consider what was the gravity of the fall down, how serious was it. It's not going to be the same for everyone. There are different levels of sin. Now, what was, now somebody may smoke a cigarette or something by bad habit, or maybe he took a drink of something he shouldn't have drank. But there's a lot worse, a lot worse things could happen. I won't go into details, you can think for yourself. And so on the basis of exactly what's being done, what we have to consider. People do have views, they have very strong views, and somebody commits something sinful, then the, the, they have to judge it. They have to consider what is the proper method of dealing with it, how to deal with it. Now, it does say, this Apichat Sudaracharo, that he's, uh, he's a devotee, he's considered saintly. All right, he's considered saintly. So, he fell, hit an accident, he fell down. Is he still a devotee? Of course, he's still a devotee. But he may not be given so much responsibility as what he had before. That previously he's given a lot of, maybe he had some responsible position. So maybe, you know, if he's committed something quite serious, he may have to give up some of his responsibility. He may have to take a lower standing because of the sinful activity because of the fall down. Because if he takes a lower standing, then there's not so much pressure on him anymore. And sometimes, you know, people get up on a big position, a big position, and the higher up you go, then the easier it is to fall down. So sometimes it's better to come down to a lower level and be on another level and just be a, an ordinary devotee and not to be like too prominent, you don't want to be too prominent, but if somebody is very prominent, then it's a problem. Understand? Thank you, Maharaj. So, Maharaj, uh, the next question is that Narsimha Mantra, that is Ugram Veera Mahavishnu, can, be can, can that be chanted only in the evening, because Lord appeared in the evening, or can it be chanted any time, any number of times? Is there any restriction on that? Well, I'm sorry, I've never heard anything about this. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not very expert in these kind of details, but I would imagine that we could chant it any time. I understand in the Mayapur temple we chant it regularly without regard to time. Sometimes in the morning we will chant, for example, the deities being opened, so the deities appearing, right? Opening the curtain, opening the doors of the altar, the deities appearing. So it's not just the deity appears in the evening, the deity also appears every time on the altar for RTs and different occasions. Thank you, Maharaj. 
Uh, the next question is, if the fact of that living entities fall down into the material existence is eternal, that it is not like the process of liberation from birth, birth, old age, disease, that cannot stop, then the continual process of falling down, does this process ever stop? How do we understand this? Well, so long as we're in material world, it doesn't stop. So long as we're conditioned souls, we're going to keep taking birth and dying. We'll remain in birth and death. That's why we want to get out of the material world. We want to go back to Godhead, to get free of birth and death. But so long as we remain in this material world, then certainly we'll continue falling will continue to up and down, taking birth and dying, going through different species of life. It's going to go on. So we have to we have to understand the situation that we're here in this material world, and it's not pleasant. There, there's there's constant birth and death. It's going on. It's been going on since time immemorial, and it's going to go on, it's going to remain. Even after the destruction of the world, everything is destroyed. After some time there will be creation again, and we'll have to take birth again. And again there will be again birth and death, and it will continue. So the process is continuous, it's eternal, in the material realm. But we don't, this is not our real home. We're meant to get out of this material world. We're meant to solve this problem of birth and death and go back to Godhead. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. Thanks a lot. Maharaj, uh, the next question is, chanting Narsimha Kavacha, is it, is it, does it fall in the category of Karma Kanda or is it Mati Mark? It depends on your motive. What is your motive in chanting that mantra? Are you chanting it simply for the pleasure of the Lord? Are you, plan are, are you chanting with some material desire? You want to get something. That will make the difference. It's not just chanting the mantra. It's why are you chanting? What are you thinking when you're chanting? Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, now Uttam Krishna Prabhu, you have raised your hand. Uh, would you like to ask your question? Unmute yourself. We are allowing you to unmute now. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. For my purification. Maharaj, my question to today's class, your Holiness says, Sila Rupa Goswami Maharaj has given five most important devotional service. One of them is like retiring in Holy Dham or spiritual space. So, we being a Brihastha, Four activities we are doing, definitely by all of your blessing, by your blessing, but we are not residing in a holy dham, or figure like Mayapur, Kavati, Vrindavan, some places. So in that case, what should be our ideal situation, or what we should be intent in our mind? Well, we should endeavor to make our home like a holy place. You keep a tosi plant, you have a nice altar and temple, you decorate it, and you constantly chant the holy name of the Lord and play spiritual sound vibrations. Your walls are covered with pictures of the different forms of the Lord and pastimes of the Lord and the holy places connected with the Leela of the Lord. In this way your home is not different from the holy place. It's like an embassy of the holy place. And so th this is the idea that Wherever you are, you have to make that place a holy place. When Vidura returned to Hastinapur after many years of traveling to holy places, he was greeted by Maharaj Yudhisthira. And Maharaj Yudhisthira told him that you are the personification of the holy places because you carry in your heart the Supreme Lord. Bhavambhida Bhagavatas Tirta Bhutta Swayam Vibho Tirti Kurvanti Tirtani Swantastena Gadabrataha. Maharaj Yudhisthira used these words to greet Vidura. He said, You are the personification of the holy places. 
So it's the devotees, it's the presence of a devotee that makes a place holy. So you want to make your home like that. You want to make your home just like a holy place, right? You don't, in a holy place, or in, no arguing, no quarreling, no nonsense talk. Hmm. You want to avoid mundane sound vibrations like movies and televisions. Just take shelter of the holy name, keep the purity, and that way your home will become just like a holy place. So you don't need to go and live in the holy place, you need to bring the atmosphere of the holy place into your home. That is required. That is, that's what we see in, in places like Vrindavan. When you go to Vrindavan, you'll often hear in the homes in Vrindavan, you can hear people doing kirtan. The people who live there in the Holy Dham, they do these kind of things. And you can do it too in your home, wherever you are. You make your place just like a holy place. Understand? Yes, Father, thank you so much. But only one thing Maharaj is lacking. Being grievous to husband-wife, sometimes we argue, sometimes we quarrel. That is not available so far. Yes, well, you want to avoid that. You want to minimize that, definitely. And, you know, when these things happen, you should understand this is not so good for your Krishna consciousness. It takes two people to okay. quarrel. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Don't know what to say Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much. So, Maharaj, all the questions are answered today. Oh, okay. And now I would like to, I would like to ask uh, His Grace Asamat Prabhu from Avtari Desh to offer a vote of thanks on behalf of both the Yatras. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Thank you very much uh, for your kind association. Uh, we are always uh, so fortunate and happy to receive your wonderful kindness and association. Maharaj, today's class was very, very relevant and I believe one should hear it again and again uh, while taking notes uh, on behalf of our Yatra leaders, you know, His Grace Bahuru, Narasimha Prabhu, Siddha Garanga Prabhu, Varad Gopal Prabhu and Gopi Jana Krishna Prabhu. Uh, I, I saw that each and every point, Maharaj, which you spoke was so very, very relevant and important and uh, answer to the last question and also you said that even this pandemic we can take association and you are appearing on our screen as Tirthi Kurvanti Tirthani and manifesting Krishna in our heart, Maharaj. So, uh, just for my benefit, for purification and for the sake of repetition, I won't take long, but just would like to take, uh, speak about few takeaways, which very important point which you told Maharaj in your class. So you started your class, Maharaj, by describing how Sukhdeva Goswami is describing about creation and primary phase, then the secondary phase of creation and then different type of hell. And Parikshit Maharaj, being a devotee, he becomes concerned how devotees can be delivered. And you told about that uh, there are three causes of sinful life. One is sinful activity itself, sinful desire, and also the ignorance. And then Shukdev Goswami uh, describing about the process of atonement, which is meant for materialistic people, as you said. And Parikshit Maharaj was not very happy, Maharaj, and he compared this to the bathing of an elephant. And then Shukdev Goswami Maharaj gave the process of Gyan Kand and, uh, you know, uh, but without waiting to hear uh, further from Parikshit Maharaj, as you very rightly said, Maharaj, that he actually spoke about the supreme, uh, uh, you know, atonement, which is the performance of devotional service, which is like rising of the sun, and it can actually dispel all the darkness in the heart of a person. And also, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, you mentioned Maharaj, told that the life's goal is Prema Kumarto Mahan, and how in uh, Sukhdev Goswami describes this process of Bhakti Yoga and serving the lotus feet of a devotee and Prabhupada elaborately writes in this purport. And also like the Krishna consciousness process is very very practical Maharaj. In the whole class you actually demonstrated that and uh, told how it is like Akutho Bhayam and once one takes the process of Krishna consciousness then he will be free from the fear and uh, the process is so wonderful that you can progress gradually from uh, Adho Shraddha to the process of Prem Bhakti and uh, you said that in other process you know either people become envious uh, in, in you know Karam Kand or they will actually you will become alone or lonely if you perform Gyan Kand but Bhakti is full of variety and if you perform Bhakti then every second there is a bliss uh, so very very nicely Maharaj you actually said and you said that the surrender is also done in a very pleasant manner and we have to control the mind and the senses and 
understand the principles and these principles are not just the moral principle but these are the principles of knowledge and finally maharaj you very nicely told about the nine angas of bhakti five of them are very prominent hearing chanting associating deity worship and reciting in holy naam and you said that shila prabhupad very expertly incorporated all these five angas into his con and we can experience the surcharge of the spiritual energy and you your gave also example that how you got attracted to the spiritual energy of krishna consciousness and the conclusion of verse maharaj which you told very nicely that surrender to lord uh, one will not fear yamraj and then you told the story of uh, ajamil that how his sin have been destroyed and uh, shila prabhupad gave uh, this this wonderful process in iskon and sukhdev goswami ultimately establishes the supremacy of the path of devotional service over all other path and the conclusion is given in bhagavad gita shrimad bhagavatam and many many other scriptures so we should just take the advantage of this bhakti yoga and perfect our life and one very nice point maharaj i liked uh, in your question answer session also where you said that uh, we all think that ajamil just chanted once but you said no constantly ajamil was chanting the holy name and he was doing satatam kirtayanto and then uh, we should also make our home into uh, a holy place holy dham by worshiping tulsi and the deities and then we will be completing all the five limbs of devotional service which is given by shila prabhupad so wonderfully and performed by the devotees so thank you very very much maharaj uh, you know wonderful points and wonderful association uh, and blessings which you have given so on behalf of both the yatras we would like to express our sincerest heartfelt gratitude to you today and always maharaj thank you very much hari krishna hari krishna thank you is all in his bhakti vigna vinas narsimha swami maharaj ki jai shri lal prabhu ki jai jai hari krishna thank you rasamit prabhu once again once again thank you maharaj Uh, for giving your association okay. uh, now we'll now we'll end the meeting uh, for all thank you uh, adoshlo you can end the meeting now